most people, the word desert conjures up images of lonely sand dunes. There are perhaps 20 different types of desert on Earth, ranging from snow-swept plateaus to cactus-clad mountains. What makes a desert a desert is lack of water. This is the Arizona desert, and at first glance, this dry, thorny landscape looks incredibly hostile, and it is. US cavalry officers posted here in the 1880s described this region as the most difficult in North America. But despite its appearance, this is a desert where you can survive. And in this program, I'm going to explore the skills of a people who truly mastered living here, the Apache. There's a hot wind pushing the temperature close to 100. The ground's baking, and you'll lose at least a gallon of sweat a day. Yet the Apache were perfectly at home here. These photographs taken in 1886 are the only visual record of Native Americans actually on the warpath. Geronimo was their most famous warrior who used his knowledge of this environment to fight one of the most successful guerrilla wars ever waged. I've long been fascinated by how a handful of warriors using survival skills could outwit 5,000 troops. Desert hiking can be immensely rewarding, but it's not a place to go unprepared. Obviously, you're going to need basic outdoor equipment, compass, map, and so on. But there are a few items that are considered absolutely essential. You've got to, first of all, be dressed right, making sure you've got long sleeves and good protection from the sun, good sturdy boots to protect you from the cactus and thorns, some means of making fire, a mirror in case you have to signal, and a torch with plenty of spare batteries so that you can move safely at night when snakes are about. The most important thing of all is plenty of water. I carry at least six litres for a day. With water always in short supply in the desert, little brooks like this one can be a real godsend. But the problem is you can't drink this water as you find it. Slow flowing streams like this harbour Cryptosporidium and Giardia. And the last thing I want on a desert hike is diarrhoea and dehydration. So when I'm moving around, what I do is I use a simple filter like this one that sterilizes the water and filters it all in one. But bad water's not the only hazard out here. There are giant centipedes that bite, poisonous spiders like this brown recluse, the deadly black widow, fist-sized tarantulas, the venomous Gila monster, and last but not least, swarms of biting ants. It's been a while since I was last here, so I'm taking a quick refresher course on the nasties. You look like at a place like this, you think about the shade and the comfort yeah. in this area, and yet if you came over here and you sat down, you'd be sitting right around. If you check here, you'd be seeing all these little black widows. That's what all of these various burrows are all about. Yeah. Also, to be found in an area like this are uh, our most dangerous scorpion is called a bark scorpion. Here you go, here's one. Doesn't look like much, but he's got quite the little stinger to him. In Africa, they say if it's got small pincers, it's got a lot of venom. That's right. If the, if the animal's pincers are very light, probably all that it's doing is holding its prey while it stings it, and then the venom actually does the killing. And if he stung you, what would you do? If he stung me right now, I would try to stay very calm and um, go and find help by walking out of here and uh, going to a road and trying to flag somebody down. And also, you notice I'm, hold I'm holding him with a pair of pliers and yet he got out. So, whoops. <laughs> you, uh, you, you, want, you, you don't want to mess with animals you don't know anything about. Yeah. Don't and, drop him again. I'll try not to. <laughs> Did it help your heart beat any? <laughs> I'm not so calm anymore. All <laughs> right, I think I'll let you go first. All right. Ray's colleague, Barney Tomberlin, has been searching for a diamond-backed rattlesnake to show us, and he's found one. Wow, it's beautiful. It's a real nice diamond back. Looks like he's got a meal in him too, down here. What would happen if it bit you? If it's a big snake, it can be a dangerous bite. You can have some blood problems, and, and it swells and gets very ugly and so forth. And you don't feel good, it's very painful. The good news is a rattlesnake doesn't always inject venom if it bites you. The bad news is it doesn't always rattle a warning before it strikes. 
So a big enough snake with a hard enough bite in, and it's hot would even go through a pair of, of, of uh, relatively heavy boots. So, okay, tell me the best tips then to avoid getting bitten. Well, don't play with them. If you see yeah. a snake, leave it alone, respect it. But if you're climbing, you have to be aware of putting your hands up on the rock to pick yourself up. There's nothing like lifting yourself up and having a coil rattlesnake be the object Yo. that comes right into eyesight. <laughs> and that's happened. That's, that's happened a, to me, and I'm sure it's happened to many other people. It's a bad scene to be on eye level with one. What about <clears throat> where it bites you? How important is that? That's real important. Uh, most, most bites are in the arms and legs. I think there was one in Phoenix last year in the face of the neck, and uh, that guy died, and that was a Western Diamondback. Like you said to hear me. I'm going to make a journey in a pateria, what's now called Southern Arizona. The route would have been well known to the Apache. I'm starting at the stronghold of one of their most famous chiefs, Cochise, and heading south to Skeleton Canyon, which was a secret cross-border pass into Mexico. This is the starting place for my journey. I'm standing in Cochise's stronghold. It was from this mountain fastness that Cochise and his Apache warriors could look out with an eagle's eye view of Sulphur Springs Valley and all the surrounding countryside. Well, it may look tranquil now, but if I'd come here 100 years ago, it would have meant certain death. Back then, this was a battlefield. Now it's a virtually uninhabited wilderness that silently carries the scars of the past. All of the skills I'm going to show you are based on first-hand accounts written at the time. Walking through this terrain is really hard on your feet, particularly your boots. For the Apache, with only moccasins, that meant they had to change the soles on them every four days or every 100 miles, whichever came first. For running repairs, they had a neat little trick. They used the agave, cutting just behind the spine and pulling it down like this. And I'll show you what they did with that. First of all, just loosen it up like this. Then using the back of my knife, I'll start to scrape off all that pulpy material. And there we are. All these fibers will dry nice and strong. And there's the thorn still attached like a needle. It's lovely stuff. Most Apaches would carry three or four of these coiled up, dry, down the side of their moccasins, ready for use. Hunted by both the American and the Mexican armies, the Apache perfected hit and run warfare. Returning from raids to the safety of the mountains, where only the brave or the foolhardy would pursue them. Geronimo said of these times, we were reckless of our lives because we felt that every man's hand was against us. If we returned to the reservation, we would be put in prison and killed. If we stayed in Mexico, they would continue to send soldiers to fight us. So we gave no quarter to anyone and asked no favors. Well, this is the southern tip of Dragoons, what I've been heading for. It's been a hard walk to get here, but luckily I haven't seen any snakes. Now the next part of my journey takes me across that valley, that Sulphur Springs Valley. And the temperature out there, well, that's somewhere in the hundreds, probably 110, something like that. So I'm not gonna cross that by day. I'm gonna wait till night when it's a lot cooler. A hundred years ago, the Apache would have crossed that by night too. Not so much because of the heat, but because of the danger of being spotted by soldiers. For most of the 1800s, Apache were hunted like animals. There was a shoot on sight policy. They had a price on their heads, 100 pesos for a warrior's scalp, 50 for a woman's, and 25 for a child's. Not surprisingly, they mistrusted all attempts at a truce with the government, preferring to keep on the run, relying on their traditional skills. The soldiers pursuing them were baffled by their ability to disappear into this barren landscape, which they found so unforgiving. 
If you know what you're doing, you need never be without fire in this desert. This plant here is called Sotol, and this dry flowering stem makes an excellent hand drill fire lighting set. A good tip when you're travelling in these parts is always to carry gloves, because most of these desert plants are covered in thorns for protection. The wood's really light, but it's also strong. And that is why the Apache also used it for another job. They took the tip of a cavalry sabre, lashed it in the end, and made a lance for fighting with. Whenever they gathered materials like this, they'd also collect up the seeds and scatter them widely to make sure that whenever they came back here, they'd have resources. Sotol is one of the easiest woods that you can use for friction fire lighting. Once you've mastered the technique, you need never carry matches here. What I've done is I've drilled in a hole here, the same diameter as the end of the drill. Now what I've got to do is cut a notch into this, and that's critical because in that notch, a small powder is going to collect that gives us the ember with which I'll light my fire. Once it's prepared, it only takes a few seconds to make fire. Well, this is it then, night time, the perfect time to travel in the desert in terms of temperature, although it's still warm enough that I only need a shirt. Got to be careful though, because this time of night is when the rattlesnakes are most active. So I've got my stick just to give me any forewarning, and I'm going to keep my eyes peeled, and keep a torch handy. Of course, moving at night was the way the Apache stayed ahead of their enemies, and they were able to cover great distances under the cover of darkness, and that's exactly what I'm gonna to try to do myself. I'd arranged to rendezvous with the crew at dawn, but I was an hour or so late. It was a really hard 20 mile hike, but the Apache would have left me way behind and been well hidden in the hills by now. Their relentless endurance must have been incredible. There are even accounts of them outpacing the cavalry. Hi guys. Go ahead. Got any water? Get back. Make it. <laughs> that is a long way. What about the fence there? No, I'm not kidding. Do you think? A couple. Oh. I need that. How's your hotel? I'm about halfway through the journey now in a very well hidden canyon that we know for sure was used by the Apache. In fact, the poles from their shelters survived here into the 1920s. Back there behind me, that's Sulphur Springs Valley. That's where I've crossed 
and this is where I'm going to set up a fixed camp because just as the Apache found, there's all the resources here I need to do it. It's a really well hidden little canyon, but there's one problem. It's so dry, I think I'm going to have real trouble finding water. A hundred years ago, there'd have been water in the creeks hereabouts, but today the water level's dropped. So I'm having to resort to this technique to try and get a drink. I'm making a solar still. And basically, what I've got in here is a billy can in this deep hole, and I'm filling the hole with uh, soft, pulpy cactus, prickly pear, and I'm gonna put polythene over the top and try to condense moisture out of it. This tube acts as a straw to suck up any water that collects in my billy can. The stick stops dirt and insects from getting in. The plastic has to be well sealed round the edges and then a stone weighs it down so that the condensed water drips into the can below. It's a long while since this riverbed saw any water, but it's still it's worth exploring it because further up, it's quite likely I'm gonna find some pockets of water just trapped there in the shade. You've got to persevere. An hour searching, and there it is. That's great, more water. Of course, the other way, cleaning water up from rivers, is the old way, by boiling, and that's the joy of a fixed camp. Mind you, when you're in deserts, the last thing you want to be doing is boiling your water more than necessary, because obviously, you're losing your water to steam. So the two tips, one, have a lid on your cooking pot to reduce steam coming off, and the other is only bring your water to a rolling boil. That's all you need to do to make it safe. The Apaches used this area for camps because they could find everything they needed here. This is bear grass, used for thatching shelters. Yucca, for string and food. Prickly pear cactus, the pads and fruit can be cooked and eaten. Agave, that gave me that instant needle and thread, was also a staple food. The base of the leaves is packed with carbohydrate, but is poisonous raw, as is the flowering spike, which I'll cook later. First, a use for the yucca, which I learned from a Chiricahua Apache. These are the leaves from the soap tree yucca, and I can use these to make a very simple cord. The first thing is to blunt off that nasty sharp spike there, and at this end, where it's really hard, I need to soften that first. Make the cord good and long, we take a couple of these strands and tie them at the end with a reef knot. But there we go, that's just three leaves. That's given me three, four, about five meters of cord. Really quick and simple. The yucca root also has a use. As you can see, starting to froth up because in this plant you've got a natural form of soap and it's that that the Apache used on an almost daily basis to wash themselves and their hair. As the Apache roamed this area, they built temporary shelters called wiki-ups, which in later years they covered with tarpaulins because it was quick and easy when they were on the run. The basic structure of the wiki-up is made from this stuff, desert broom, which is long and flexible. Now those are qualities that aren't easy to find in the desert where trees have a tendency to be hard, brittle and short. On top of that, I'm putting this squaw bush, which is perfect for just giving it structure 
before lastly thatching it with this stuff, bear grass. Bear grass is as tough as hell. I struggled to pull it up until I discovered that a good kick at the root really did the job. Well, that's it completed. A wiki up like this is a lot of work for one person to build, but it shows you what can be done. In a real crisis, obviously, something acceptable could be knocked together much more simply, but using the similar techniques. Well, that solar steel's been going all day now, so there should be a drink in there. But my experience of these, there's one thing I'll guarantee, there won't be enough water in there to keep me alive for any great length of time. So really, in truth, these devices are just stopgap measures. Well, as I thought, barely a mouthful and not really worth the effort it took to make. This is agave stalk, that's real Apache food. Now, obviously I can't eat it raw, so what I'm gonna do is put it on the coals of my fire and cook it overnight. Tomorrow, it'll be sweet, sugary, and great food to carry on the trail. Camping here is eerie. I can sense the ghosts of the families that used to live here. It's impossible not to feel a sadness for the way they were removed. Next morning, it's into the Chiricahua Mountains and a very different landscape. You can easily imagine how difficult it was for the cavalry to pursue the Apache up here. Now that I'm coming up into the mountains, I'm seeing all sorts of different plants. This one here is mullen, and it's this plant that I'd use up here to make fire with a hand drill. The old leaves have also got uses. The Apache used to smoke these for bronchial disorders. And if you're short of loo paper, well, it's the leaves of the young plant that are just perfect. I'm at eight and a half thousand feet, looking south into Mexico and the Sierra Madre Mountains. It's a lot cooler, and the Apache would have spent long periods of the year living here, taking advantage of the more forgiving environment. It was from these mountains that they launched countless raids into Mexico to steal horses and weapons. But I've got to go back down to the desert floor, heading for Skeleton Canyon. There are quite a few myths in the world of survival, and one of them surrounds this sort of cactus, a barrel cactus. Many survival books will tell you that you can cut the tops off of them, take the pulp inside, squeeze it in a bandana, and get a useful drink from it. Well, most barrel cacti contain oxalic acid, which is poisonous. This one could give you a drink, because this is the fishhook cactus. But you're not going to get enough water to keep you alive for any great length of time. The way to get a drink from this cactus is to use it to point you in the right direction, because they grow leaning south or southwest, and that's a handy compass when you're out in the bush. It pays not to take the thorns in the desert for granted. That is a prickly pear thorn, and it's really easily gone through the leather of my boots. In fact, my boots have had a fairly hard time of it. Look, they're absolutely falling apart already. It's a real shame they're my favorite ones too. Never mind, I'm gonna to have to wear these instead. These are Apache moccasins. And the interesting thing is, that a soldier who worked with the Apache Scouts in the 1880s said that of all of their equipment, nothing was as more important to them than those. And having seen all the thorns in this desert, I can well understand why. There's an old saying, never judge a man until you've walked a mile in his moccasins. So for the last few miles of my journey, I've ditched my rucksack and I'm carrying only what the Apache would have had. 
of that agave I cooked on the fire last night. It's perfect now and sweet, good to eat. I can dry it and keep it like this for several days. It's almost the perfect trail food. This may just look like another rocky outcrop, but during the Indian Wars, it held great strategic value for both sides. This is Mud Springs. People have been coming here for centuries, and many of these holes here are grinding holes which predate the Apaches. You can still see the graffiti left here by the soldiers sent to fight the Apache. This place was really important during the Indian Wars because this was permanent water. Both the Apaches and the cavalry used this on many occasions. So I'm really pleased to be here. There's a lot of history. I want to have a good look around. It's hard to imagine now how those wars were, but water was always the key thing, just as it is for me hiking through the desert. When the Apache broke out of the reservations, the army used to send mounted patrols out to guard known water places like this. And the Apache, well, if they came across a good source of water, once they'd had their fill, sometimes they'd poison it with the carcass of a dead coyote. I'm almost at the end of my journey with only a few more miles to Skeleton Canyon, a place that holds special significance. This walk has been more than just filmmaking. Travelling here with Apache skills has heightened my respect for this land. I can now understand why the Apache found no threat here, but instead spiritual enrichment, while their enemies found only suffering and hardship. This pile of rocks is the end of my journey. This is a guarded site, because this is the very place where Geronimo surrendered. In many ways, this was the end of his journey too, and the end of the struggle of the wild Apache peoples. But wherever you go in the world, people know the name Geronimo. On his last raid, a handful of warriors outsmarted a quarter of the US Army before choosing to surrender. It remains the most powerful demonstration of the value of survival skills. Next week, one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. <laughs>